Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's event, which is the latest in this term series of research seminars hosted by the British Centre for Literary Translation at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. My name is Duncan Large. I'm the BCLT's academic director and coordinator of the research seminar. We're running this evening's event a little later than usual because it also forms part of the BCLT's advanced German English translation workshop, which has been taking place online over the last couple of days and concludes tomorrow. If you're familiar with German history, you'll perhaps know that today, the 9th of November, bears the nickname Day of Fate, Schicksalstag, since a remarkable number of important events have happened on this day, from the proclamation of the Weimar Republic on the 9th of November, 1918, to the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989. On the 9th of November 1938, the infamous Kristallnacht pogroms marked a significant intensification in the Nazi persecution of the Jews. And against that backdrop, it's only appropriate that we should hear this evening from one of the leading experts on the role that translation has played in our understanding of the Holocaust. I'm delighted then to introduce Peter Davis, who is Professor of Modern German Studies at the University of Edinburgh. Peter was initially based at the University of Manchester, where he completed his BA and PhD, then worked as Leverhulme Trust Research Fellow, conducting research into Stalinism and literature in the GDR. He joined Edinburgh as lecturer in German in the year 2000 and has held a personal chair there since 2010. From 2000 to 2003, he co-directed the AHRB major research project, The Modern Restoration, Rethinking German Literature 1930 to 1960, which led to a co-edited volume from De Greuter in 2004. Then a year as research fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung in 2004-05 led to the monograph Myth, Matriarchy and Modernity, Johann Jakob Bachofen in German culture 1860 to 1945. Peter has been researching at the interface between translation studies and Holocaust studies since he co-founded the AHRC funded Holocaust and Translation Research Network in 2010. In 2014, he edited a special issue of the journal Translation and Literature devoted to Holocaust testimony and translation. In 2017, he co-edited the Bloomsbury volume Translating Holocaust Lives, and the following year published the monograph Witness Between Languages, the Translation of Holocaust Testimonies in Context with Camden House. He's re recently begun a new two-year Leverhulme Trust Research Fellowship with the project, How Are Victims' Voices Heard? Interpreting and Translation at a Holocaust Trial. Peter is Vice President of the Association for German Studies in Great Britain and Ireland, and a member of the Executive Committee of the British and Irish Association for Holocaust Studies. Welcome, Peter. Thank just, you, before Peter. I, just before I hand over, um, let me say that after Peter's talk, we'll have time for a question session. Um, we're using the Zoom webinar platform and that allows you to submit questions via the Q&A button. Uh, and you can also upvote others' questions that you would particularly like to see answered. Um, that function will be available all the way through. So do feel free to submit your questions and I'll put them to Peter on your behalf at the end. As with previous BCLT events, this <laughs> seminar is being recorded and the recording will be available soon on our YouTube channel, where you'll also find recordings of previous seminars and other BCLT events. For now, though, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Peter for a talk which is titled Whose Words, Whose Voices? What Thinking About Translation Can Tell Us About the Holocaust. Thank you so much, Duncan, and thank you particularly uh, to you and your colleagues for this invitation to speak on this very significant date um, in the calendar that you have you set out in your introduction. Um, it's always you feel a sort of responsibility, I think, talking on dates like this in about German history. Um, so I hope I will try to do this justice and 
um, thinking about the sort of the issues of translation and what translation can tell us about history is that kind of interface that I'm really interested in. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Leverhulme Trust for sponsoring this research as well. As Duncan mentioned, this is part of a fellowship that I'm involved in over the next couple of years. Um, I'm really interested in talking about these issues to different audiences because anybody who does work that we sort of define however vaguely as interdisciplinary um, is always dealing with different kinds of people who are interested in the things that you have to say. And um, I sometimes give talks like this to historians and they have very different attitudes, interests, lack of interest, sort of objections, questions to, to the things that I'm doing. But I'm aware here that I'm, I'm speaking to a whole load of translators and people who are interested in translators and literary translation. So some of this is going to be preaching to the converted a little bit. Um, you don't need to be persuaded of the importance of translation and the importance of drawing attention to translation and thinking about translation. But I am interested in this this, this point of intersection between translation, testimony, and history. Um, so I'd be really interested to see what you have to say about this afterwards. Um, okay, I you're about to hear the voice of Helene Goldman. Helene was a Czech Jew who was deported to Auschwitz in May 1944, survived, settled uh, in the United States after the war. In 1964, she was invited to West Germany, to Frankfurt, to give evidence in the trial of 21 former SS men whom she had known during her time in the camp. And this it becomes, became known as the first Frankfurt Auschwitz trial. It's a very important moment in West German history in, in the mid 1960s. Now let's try to understand the situation that she found herself in. Firstly, the disorientation and anxiety connected with coming to Germany 20 years after liberation and sitting before a judge who would ask her to describe in detail her horrific memories of the her horrific memories for the court. Her personal testimony would then be questioned and challenged by the defense. She sits at a small table in the middle of a very large room. In front of her, on a stage, the panel of judges and magistrates. To her right, other court officials and a very large plan of Auschwitz and Birkenau hanging on the wall, sort of reminding her of her time. Uh, in the camp. To her left, the defendants, the former SS men and their counsels, the men who she knew by sight and whose acts of violence she had to describe. And behind her, a very large crowd of spectators, well-wishers, family members of the defendants and journalists taking note. So there's a lot of people listening in and she's sitting right in the middle of this, very alone and very vulnerable. Now, on its own, this would be enough pressure for anyone, but worse than this, the proceedings are taking place in German, a language that she follows, she can follow, because uh, she learned it at school and had to speak it in the camp, but she could only follow it with some difficulty. Her only means of understanding everything that's happening is provided by her interpreter, Regina Schmidt-Ott, who is sitting at this small table next to her. Mrs. Goldman has chosen to speak English rather than Czech, which she could have spoken, and her words are translated for the court. All seems to be going smoothly, but then something happens. Now, it doesn't matter here whether you understand German at all. In fact, it's helpful in this case if you don't, as I'd like us to try to imagine what's going through Mrs. Goldman's mind when her source of understanding breaks down. In this extract, you will hear Helene Goldman and her interpreter, Regina Schmidt-Ott, the presiding judge, Hans Hofmeier, who asked the questions, and later on, the prosecution counsel, Joachim Kugler. What I'm going to do is to share my screen and hope that the audiovisual um, works. So please do let me know if it doesn't. I'm going to play you an extract that lasts about two and a half minutes, and I will um, also scroll down the screen here so you can follow it in English and German. Wann sind Sie nach Auschwitz gekommen? And when did you come to Auschwitz? In May, just a few days, about five, six days. In uh, May, ungefähr. But a week later, something like Ungefähr that. fünf bis sechs Tage, beziehungsweise eine Woche später, nachdem man mich in, in meinem Heimatort verhaftet hatte. Also etwa Ende Mai 1944. About the end of May? In around the middle of May. We weren't there too long in Mitte Tatschewa. Mai. We were just a few days. Wir waren eben nicht sehr lange in Tatschewa. Es wird ungefähr Mitte Mai gewesen sein. Wie, wo wurden Sie ausgeladen? 
And where did you leave the wagon in Auschwitz? At the st train station. Am Bahnhof. War das, uh, they der didn't leave, they waited for us. Uh, who waited for you? Well, all the uh, German officers. Also, man erwartete uns bereits auf dem Bahnhof, also yeah. die Offiziere. War das der normale Bahnhof der Stadt Auschwitz oder war das ein Gleis außerhalb der Stadt und in der Nähe des Lagers? Was this a normal station of Auschwitz or was it a special railway it leading was directly? It like a cattle car railway. Well, it wasn't but, special. No, but the station itself, was it a special station? It or didn't know, it, it didn't look special. Nein, es sah in keiner Weise anormal aus oder ungewöhnlich. Es war der normale Bahnhof. And if it was, I was too scared to look. Because I was very scared. Ich hab, hatte große Angst und habe mir das auch nicht so furchtbar genau angesehen. Mm -hmm. Sagen Sie, mh, wer hat Sie dort erwartet? And who did wait for you at the station exactly? Well, there were SS men, Gestapo men, and uh, Dr. Lucas. Ja, SS Leute, Gestapo Leute und Dr. Lucas. Vorsitzende, ich bedauere einwerfen zu müssen. Ich glaube nicht, dass äh, bei der Schwierigkeit der Materie die Übersetzung ausreicht. Es fehlt also äh, He, uh, an, needs, uh, an, den, an den verschiedensten Dingen. Pardon? They say my English is not sufficient uh, for the, this very difficult translation. Also ich habe, ich habe Bedenken bei der, bei der äußerst schwierigen Frage, die hier geprüft werden soll, ob der Angeklagte Dr. Lukas die Selektion vorgenommen hat oder nicht. Ich kann also well, say, my translation doesn't, is not sufficient because, uh, um, Also ich habe nicht, ich habe nicht jedes Mal uh, eingewandt, wenn etwas nicht I übersetzt was, worden ist. Uh, hang on a moment, I'll just bring myself back. Um, so, in the middle of her story about arriving at the camp, the prosecution counsel, Joachim Kugler, raises objections to the translation. And everything seems to go, to go wrong in the middle of that, and she's really not sure what's happening. Amongst other things, he's concerned that the translation is making it difficult to identify one of the SS men, Dr. Lucas. But from the perspective of Mrs. Goldman, the security of being able to follow what's going on is suddenly challenged, and she has no idea what's happening around her. What does it mean if the translation is problematic? Can't she get her point over clearly? Will her testimony be distorted? What are these people arguing about all of a sudden? She's gone from a reasonably confident narrative to a feeling of isolation and insecurity. And she's already feeling a little bit nervous about it, despite her, you know, confident telling because she talks about feeling scared and I think when she talks about feeling scared she doesn't just mean I was scared in the camp she means this situation is making me feel scared too but she's giving a testimony despite this but is feeling rather insecure and then when the translation goes wrong or there's this argument about translation she's completely disorientated. Now the interpreter Regina Schmidt-Ott feels that her competence is being questioned, which of course it is, and she's caught in the middle of an argument. She's trying to understand what the problem is, while at the same time helping Mrs. Goldman to understand what's happening. So she suddenly has to do several things at once and work out whose side she's on. If we imagine ourselves for a moment sitting where Helene Goldman is sitting, in that difficult situation, with our only access to what's going on around us, the voice of the interpreter, Regina Schmidt-Ott, then we get an idea of how it feels to be entirely dependent on translation. It's not simply a technical matter, but it's to do with connection and disconnection, knowledge and ignorance, isolation and belonging. But most importantly, it's taken for granted until it goes wrong or until it seems to go wrong, as in this case. There's basically nothing wrong with the translation here. But here, as so often, when communications break down, it's the translators who get the blame. They go from being taken for granted to being visible and vulnerable. So what I want to talk about today is not good or bad translation or what translators should or shouldn't be doing, but what happens when translation becomes visible, when we stop taking it for granted and ignoring it, but instead think about what it means to be dependent on it, 
as Helene Goldman was. We can do a thought experiment. What would our knowledge about the Holocaust be like if we did not have translation? This is the conclusion I've come to. The Holocaust is literally unthinkable without translation. The series of events and structures of power that we refer to as the Holocaust, the processes of occupation and forced or voluntary collaboration, the deportations and concentration of populations, the domination and transformation of space, the organization of forced labor, mass killing and resistance to it, and the complexity of communication that these entail. None of this would have been possible without translation and interpreting. The Holocaust was, amongst many other things, an essentially multilingual event. Anyone who's worked on or thought about the Holocaust knows this, but I wonder whether we've really thought through the consequences of this fact, not only for what we know about the Holocaust, but how we know it, how we interpret it, what stance we take up towards it. Now, there are a lot of questions we could ask. How did translation affect the processing, dissemination and interpretation of information during the Holocaust? How did authorities use translation to transmit orders or understand what was happening in multilingual societies? How did victims, resistors or collaborators use translation to understand their situation or achieve their aims? There are so many open questions, even before we get to the most important one. Who were the translators? What conditions did they work under? How did they understand their work? from the highest level of professional diplomatic translators and interpreters, right down to informal conversations and panicked, urgent exchanges of information that could make the difference between life and death. The number of people is uncountable and the number and variety of translation situations almost unfathomable. So this may be one reason why we talk about translation so little. It seems overwhelming in its scale and importance, but also ungraspable and ephemeral in all but a small number of documented cases. Now, a lot of research has been done over the last couple of decades on the significance of translation for our understanding of the Holocaust, but it's still not really entered the mainstream. To take just two examples, there's been fascinating research on translating and interpreting by prisoners in concentration camps by Michaela Wolf and others, including amazing work on sign language interpreters in Auschwitz by Mark Zaurov. It's a really fascinating subject. On a different subject, Lisa Muckley has shown how translations of Goebbels' speeches affected how the readers of the British press interpreted his words and intentions. And there are many others I could name, all of whose work has inspired my thinking on this subject, but it really just scratches the surface. When you start to look, stories and hints about translation leap out at you everywhere. At the level of diplomacy, there were interpreters such as Paul Otto Schmidt of the German Foreign Ministry, who amongst many other things, interpreted at meetings between Hitler and Neville Chamberlain in Munich in 1938. Or Eugen Dolman, who interpreted during the phone call between Hitler and Mussolini after the assassination attempt on Hitler's life in July 1944, and who wouldn't want to have listened into that conversation? We know a lot about figures such as Paul Otto Schmidt or Eugen Dolman, but there's much more than this. Just as with any other colonial enterprise, the Nazi war of expansion and occupation relied on multiple levels of communication and language use, entailing constant dynamic translation activity. But how much do we know about the people who did the work? When we listen to survivors themselves, they often speak or write about moments of translation that they were involved in. These dramatic moments are often key turning points in their story when understanding or communicating something was vital to survival. In perhaps the most well-known example, Primo Levi writes about trying and failing to translate Dante in Auschwitz and what this means for his inability to find a language to talk about what he's experiencing. But there are plenty of others. Richard Glaser, one of the few victims to survive the Treblinka extermination camp, describes in his memoir how translation helped to support resistance networks in the camp, which were made up of multilingual, multinational uh, survivors. The Auschwitz survivor Raya Kagan spoke at the trial in Frankfurt that I mentioned at the beginning about her own activity as a translator in Auschwitz, a prisoner obliged to act as mediator between the SS and her fellow prisoners. But at the same trial, the former Soviet POW and Auschwitz survivor Andrei Pokorzhev spoke about the translators at the camp as being degenerate and cruel exploiting their power over the prisoners. So even in that small number, you have so many different perspectives on what translation is and what it means and how people do it. 
There are so many stories that one hears, which are in turn horrifying, dramatic, comic, grotesque, moving. Listen carefully to how survivors tell their stories, and you'll find that more often than not, translation is hidden somewhere in the story. And the stories about translation are all about power, about the use and abuse of language, about resistance to power or compromise with power in order to survive. Translation makes occupation and genocide possible, but it also makes resistance and survival possible. There's an important lesson here for us in stories about translation. There is no neutral or objective position for a translator to take up. The translator is always in some way involved. But there are other issues here too. These stories about translation are all told in retrospect, meaning that translation plays a narrative role in the telling of the story, often as a turning point, a dramatic climax or an impulse for reflection. The stories are more about survival than about a detailed, accurate description of translation activity and context. They're about wit, creativity, the ability to understand a situation quickly and decide how to react, to be two steps ahead of everyone else. They're about being able to move between cultures and languages, to slip backwards and forwards, to put on disguises and adopt different identities. Now I'm gonna come back to this later, as it shows something vital about the way we talk about translation and the Holocaust. Talking about translation always also means talking about something else too. So the Holocaust is unthinkable but, uh, without translation. Now I'm using the word unthinkable deliberately and literally here as it brings me to the second point, which is the major focus of this talk. I'm talking here about how important translation has been for our ability even to see the events of the Holocaust in their true nature. The defining role that translators have also played after the event in helping us piece together a picture of what happened and how it was experienced, as well as how that understanding has changed through the decades. Translation has made possible the comparison of documents and testimonies in multiple languages in order to bring out what the experiences of victims had in common beyond the boundaries of their means of expression. Translation has made it possible to think of this whole complex of events and experiences as part of one process, and to understand it beyond national and linguistic boundaries, to see it as what we now know as the Holocaust, not just as a series of individual crimes. This has required translation and the constant work of translators. Now, maybe this seems like a commonplace, but it has real consequences. The Holocaust, as a concept that emerged in scholarship, commemoration and political discourse in the decades, oops, oh, I've just, sorry, I've just lost my place. Yeah, so I'll start that paragraph again. This seems like a commonplace, but it has real consequences. The Holocaust, as a concept that emerged in scholarship, commemoration and political discourse in the decades following the end of the Second World War, has processes of translation written into its structure. Translation is there from the beginning. We cannot think the Holocaust without also thinking about translation, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. And mostly, we do not. The American scholar Naomi Seidman has, in a wonderful phrase, described the creation of the Holocaust as a translation project, through which the experiences of the Jewish victims are interpreted and translated for a non-Jewish audience. This is a radical suggestion, and seeing it this way makes clear why discussion of translation can generate anxiety. Will the experience be understood or misinterpreted? Will it be put to use in a way that was not intended originally? How much influence do witnesses and survivors have over how their words are translated? So again, translation is not neutral. It's not simply saying the same thing in a different language, but it's about risky journeys and the possibility of failure or misunderstanding. The journeys that testimonies take are sometimes as dramatic and complex as the journeys taken by survivors. Naomi Seidman goes on to say this, in becoming an international discourse, Historical events that largely transpired in one set of languages were brought into entirely different cultural and linguistic systems. And only through such movement, movement were these narratives eventually heard as the Holocaust. So, Seidman says, it's the movement of texts, statements, testimonies between languages and contexts that gives us the idea of the Holocaust in the first place. But the Holocaust as a translation project is much broader. It also involves the translation of archive documents, legal proceedings, and other kinds of texts, including autobiographical works by non-Jewish victims, as well as texts by documents and documents by perpetrators. What gets translated and what doesn't 
as a direct effect on how the Holocaust is understood in a particular country, which in turn has an effect on what is translated. Despite these problems, we rely on translation to make texts accessible to us that otherwise would not be. Imagine, for example, what our knowledge about the Holocaust would consist of in the English-speaking world if we only had access to texts composed in English. Translation is at the core of almost every discussion of the Holocaust in every country. And an army of translators, professional and non-professional, has been at work since the 1930s, ensuring that we have access to this knowledge. Why then have their astonishing achievements so rarely been properly acknowledged? This is a moment, I think, when we have to ask some difficult questions of ourselves. Now, I'm with multiple apologies to the writers Raymond Carver and Nathan Englander, who I've stolen this phrase from. Um, what do we talk about when we talk about translation? Even the words that are often used about translation in the context of the Holocaust, loyalty, betrayal, closeness, distortion, voice, possess an emotional force that tells us that there is much more at stake here than simply moving a statement from one language to another. We are not just talking about a text, even if a text is actually what we're dealing with. One often hears the view that translation should simply be about getting as close as possible to the original. But if we think for a moment about the word close, we can see that there's quite a lot at stake here. A metaphor of distance used to describe a particular interpretation of the relationship between two texts. The word close brings with it connotations of intimacy, warmth and connection and trust above all. So translating a testimony is not just about getting technical linguistic issues right, but is about creating a feeling of closeness to a witness. But what option does this leave the translator for making the text comprehensible to the target audience. Now, translation scholars talk about translation as a creative practice in which an expert reader and interpreter makes a new representation of a text that's understandable to a new audience in a specific situation and for a specific purpose. The translator is inevitably present in the text and a good translator will be well aware of the ethical issues arising from the translation of a testimony or indeed a historical document. Translation scholarly attempts scholarship attempts to tackle these issues head on. And there's been some really excellent work on this by people like Sharon Dean Cox, Jean Bose Bayer, Marion Winters, Andrea Hammer, Zaya Alexander, and many, many, many other people. A sense of the uniqueness of the situation when translating a Holocaust testimony, and therefore of the task of the translator, explains why translators' prefaces and commentaries, when they are given space to write them in the texts, so often emphasize their commitment, their personal closeness to the witness or their emotional involvement. The assumption here, I think, is that professional skill is less likely to produce a result than other kinds of care. And perhaps that there's something potentially dubious about professionalism, implying a distance, non-committed attitude, or even simple commercial motivation. But could one not equally argue that a good professional translation done by an expert might be fairer to the text in an all-round way than one done by a close acquaintance. But for the most part, translation is not mentioned as an important issue. Publication and reading practices, as well as a lot of scholarship and Holocaust studies, still prefer to treat a translation as a transparent window onto the original that allows us to enter into some kind of closeness, authenticity or directness, some kind of relationship with the survivor. Historians, teachers and Holocaust studies scholars for the most part, treat translated texts as if they were the original. Now, translation studies approaches are marginal concerns in many disciplines because they ask uncomfortable questions about the transmission and creation of knowledge and about the often marginalized people who make this possible. Thinking about translation makes us think hard about what we take for granted and how we know the things that we know. For example, it makes us think about what we mean when we talk about the voice of a witness. An interesting recent example is the retranslation into English of La Nuit by the Nobel Prize winning writer and Auschwitz survivor Elie Wiesel. And this is the original text, if you can probably just about see that. Elie Wiesel's La Nuit, one of the most famous testimonies. The translation was made by his wife, Marion Wiesel. Night is now a classic of Holocaust testimony. And along with works by Primo Levi and Anna Frank, is probably the most frequently read analyzed and taught 
of all testaments. The French text is a shortened and radically rewritten version of a memoir in Yiddish that Wiesel had published in Argentina in 1956. So it's already a form of translation. The French text was then translated into English in 1960 by the British translator, Stella Rodway. For decades, English speaking readers were familiar with the text Night in this version by Stella Rodway. The new translation by Marion Wiesel, the wife of Elie Wiesel, which was published in 2006, is advertised as being translated, and I quote, in the language and spirit, truest to the author's original intent. And the new foreword by Elie Wiesel explains that the new translation is an improvement on the older one, as his wife understands his voice better. In fact, he's rather sniffy about Stella Rodway's work in his uh, introduction to this text. Now, certainly the collaboration between Elie and Marion Wiesel has made for a fascinating new text, which restores some of the language of Jewish mysticism that had been lost in the French translation of Wiesel's original Yiddish memoir. And it corrects some factual errors as well, some historical errors. But if one asks which translation is more faithful, then things become a little bit more complicated. If you compare the two English translations, you find that the earlier translation, I think, by Stella Rodway, remains closer in style, vocabulary and syntax to the French text, while Marion Wiesel's is in many respects a fresh narration, making a claim to authenticity through personal connection to her husband and listening to the voice. Which of these then is more faithful? There are interesting questions to ask here about whether it's possible to reconstruct an original intention some 50 years later, or whether the new translation might not instead be a response to more contemporary concerns. For example, the emphasis on the quality of the witness's voice above all else. Rather than a more authentic new translation, we have instead a new text jointly written by two people. By contrast, what Stella Rodway did back in 1960 is to translate the text in order to give the English speaking reader an impression of its considerable literary qualities. Both are entirely legitimate responses, but they're trying to do di different things. Once we understand that, we begin to understand how translators work influences the way we hear the witness's voice in a particular situation. Now it's worth turning the spotlight onto the people who produce the translations. Who are they? How do they feel about their work? What conditions do they work under? So many testimony texts have been published and some continue to be even now where translators' names are not mentioned or are practically invisible. Who were and are the translators? This is not an easy question to answer in many cases. We can say with confidence that many thousands of people have been engaged in translation activity arising from the experiences of Holocaust victims, most of whom have remained invisible beyond their immediate circles. The majority of translation activity has been non-written and informal, both during the Holocaust and afterwards. The brutal uprooting and mixing of entire populations, along with the multilingual nature of many of the victims, meant that the Holocaust was experienced in and through an extraordinary variety of languages, dialects, and traditions of speech and writing. And the task of making the texts and statements produced by witnesses available to audiences in new linguistic contexts is unlikely ever to be completed. A few translators of Holocaust testimonies have become more widely known through their commitment, say, to a particular author's work. For example, Stuart Wolfe, for his in original English translations of Primo Levi's texts, Heinz Riet for the German version of Primo Levi's If This Is a Man, and there's very interesting correspondence between Primo Levi and Heinz Riet about the German version of this text. Marion Wiesel, who I've mentioned for her translations of her husband's work, or, say, Simone Schroth for her recent German retranslation of Anna Frank's diary. But most translators have either been anonymous or appear only as names on the inside cover of the book. Some generalizations are possible though. A significant proportion of translation work has always been carried out within victim groups and through the generations of the families of survivors. The international spread and linguistic diversity of victim communities has meant that translation has from the very beginning been a vital means of communicating and comparing experiences, forming and challenging interpretations, building group identities, and promoting knowledge and understanding amongst non-victims. Oral and written communication are both vital in this respect. One could therefore hypothesize that the majority of translation work has been done in private and informal contexts, under conditions that's now difficult to reconstruct many years later. 
Such translation activity is still very much a feature of survivor groups today. And there will be important work to do to investigate the translator's self-understanding and conception of their task. Translators may act differently and experience very different working conditions in these different cases. They may be amateur or professional, working for pay or on a voluntary basis, depending on the situation on and who is commissioned the translation. They may be established literary or historical translators who are commissioned to translate a testimony, translators located through an agency, or translators specialising in Holocaust-related work. They may or may not belong to the specific victim community themselves. It remains to be investigated how distinct the motivations of professional and non-professional translators are and how their motivations might affect the translations they do, if at all. Do these motivations clash with the wishes of publishers, commissioning bodies, and the victims themselves? Now, Sylvia Deegan, for example, has conducted a valuable sociological study of translators working for a concentration camp memorial in the Uckermark in northern Germany, so just north of Berlin. Investigating their working conditions, their pay, their relationship and conflicts with the commissioning authorities, as well as their level of training and their attitude towards their work. This kind of work is vital as it brings discussion of translation down to earth and helps us to see the translators as real people working in a concrete situation. How does the translator balance the need to take time and care over a testimony text, to do the required research and perhaps to talk to the survivors themselves if they're still alive, with the need to earn a living? Do people who commission translations understand enough about the expertise needed to do a good job? A translator needs a sound historical knowledge and an understanding of how the Holocaust is talked about in two languages, plus a strong feeling for style, a sensitivity to what the witness may be trying to say, an understanding of what the target readership is going to be, and an awareness of ethical issues to do with writing about other people's experiences of violence, dispossession, and loss. The translators will all have a sense of the importance of what they're doing, but this may clash with practical issues to do with time and competing demands of employers who think translation is a fairly straightforward business. Sylvia Dagan's study showed that translators were all politically committed to the project of translating survivor stories, but the employers didn't really understand the complexity, the complexity of the task and the training needed for it. So they ended up being underpaid and having to work too quickly. This, of course, for many of people um, listening to this is a familiar story, right? Translators know this story, but it's really problematic when we are dealing with something as important as a survivor testament. In order to understand how and why texts have been translated and how this has contributed to our knowledge about the Holocaust and its consequences, we need to acknowledge the complexity, specificity, and autonomy of translation as a skilled practice, as well as understanding who the translators have been and the conditions under which they've worked. If our task as readers of, of testimonies is to work on behalf of the witness and to ensure that we clear a space for the voice to be heard, then we should still proceed with care and avoid scapegoating translators. The spaces in which voices speak, including our own, is never neutral or value-free after all. What Francis Jones has called a principle of maximum awareness of ethical implications is a very useful imperative for all involved in translating testimonies and reading these translations. But there are other tasks ahead too. Most importantly, the necessity to make translation visible as a defining element in the production, mediation, and interpretation of knowledge about the Holocaust. Alongside that, we need to understand the translators themselves, their motivations and methods, and their understanding of their task, as well as the conditions under which they work. So what does it mean to make translation mainstream? There are some things that I think are currently necessary. All are to do with making visible what's been unseen and taking translation into the mainstream of thinking about the Holocaust. Here is a set of perhaps rather utopian suggestions for you. Firstly, all Holocaust education should include language learning. It really doesn't matter what language it is, but the process of encountering a different way of saying things helps us to understand witnesses better. And importantly, it stops us assuming that the way things related to the Holocaust are expressed or talked about in English is in some way natural or just common sense. Build language learning into Holocaust education programs. The next step is to acknowledge translators as expert actors, to make them visible where they're not, and include them in discussion and debate. Invite them to speak. 
Name the translator, always and under all circumstances. Pay them properly where it is in our power to do so and take their expertise seriously. If we're talking or writing about a testimony, including in an education programme, a commemoration or a historical study, include information about translators, make an effort to find that information if it's not easily available. More than that, I think we can go further than simply naming the translator. When, where and why was the translation made? Can we reconstruct the translation situation and the people involved and consider how that may have affected what we are reading in our source? Make explicit as much as is possible using the information we can access and any reasonable assumptions. Where a translator is available and willing to talk, talk to them. Use their expertise to help us understand the cultural and linguistic specificity of the text and be explicit about how this has been conveyed in translation. Make this part of our normal practice in dealing with sources and the testimonies we discuss. Go out of our way to look for things that have not been translated and do not assume that things that happen to have been translated are typical because they're usually not. Where information about translators and translation is not available, and this may well be so in many cases, I suggest the following. Make reasonable assumptions. In any situation we're thinking about in which multiple languages are in play, translation will have had a determining influence, but it may now be hidden. Assume it's happening and that somebody is doing it. Even if it's impossible to reconstruct with any certainty, it's remarkable what comes to light when we make that assumption automatically. For example, reading testimonies from ghettos and camps or thinking about the stories of refugees with an eye to who is speaking to whom, under what circumstances, who is listening or not listening, and what information is being conveyed can give us a picture of translation activity, even if the author doesn't address it directly. Assume also that translation has affected the text we are reading, that it's a composite voice in which the translator has made informed choices about how to represent the text in translation. Even what we think of as the original may have translation hidden in it somewhere, as in the case of Elie Wiesel's French testimony, which was a, a rewritten, shortened and translated version of an original Yiddish text. If we talk about testimonies as a direct encounter with the voice of the witness, then translation cannot be talked about in any meaningful way. We have to sort of sweep it under the carpet and pretend it isn't there. A good, ethically aware translator will have made choices that give us a good understanding of what the original does. But we should remember that this is the translator's interpretation of how the original works. And they may have translated for specific purposes, for example, to clarify historical evidence or to bring out psychological detail or to explain the witness's cultural background in some way. Now, there's a small example here to think about. A few years ago, I heard a conversation between translators who worked at two different memorials in Germany, one at the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin and the other at the bergen belsen Camp Memorial. Their tasks were actually quite similar, making transcripts of video interviews with survivors and then translating them into German or English so that visitors to the memorials could follow them and they can be used in educational programs. They both started with the strong ethical motivation to make the voices of the witness understandable to others while translating respectfully. But they worked in completely different ways. At the Berlin Memorial, they take careful transcripts, marking every pause and never clarifying what the witness says or correcting or improving their language to make it more understandable. When they translate, they try to imitate the language exactly to get as close as possible even where this means writing incorrect language in the translation or something that's hard to understand. For the translators, this is about respecting the way the witness speaks and not making it too easy for the reader of the translation. At Berg and Belsen, they work differently. They tidy up, correct and clarify the language of the original speaker when translating, so it's possible to follow what's being said and it's less work for the reader. In their view, this is more respectful to the witness as translating grammar mistakes or poor language or unclear expression can potentially make the witness look stupid or unreliable. So who's right? It's kind of hard to say, and it will depend on the reason for translating and the people they're translating for. But it's worth remembering that every time we read a translation of a testimony, including a short quotation made by a historian for a book we're reading, someone will have been making this kind of decision probably for every sentence they translate. 
how can I, as a reader, make judgments, you know, based on a text about things like trauma or cultural identity or even historical accuracy? If I ignore the fact that the testimony has been translated, I simply can't do it. I don't mean here to suggest that reading a translation of a text is pointless. In fact, quite the opposite. Reading the original is no substitute for reading a translation. A careful reading of a translation gives us an insight into the journey a text has taken and the difficulties of testifying cross borders. The text Night by Elie Wiesel and Marianne Wiesel from 2006 is an extraordinary read in its own right. And it contains within it so much information about how the testimonies traveled and changed since Elie Wiesel first sat down to write his Yiddish memoir in the 1950s. But reading a translation is different. We can trust a good translator to give us an ethically responsible and thorough representation of the testimony based on an expert interpretation of what the testimony is doing with its language. But we should never read a translation as if it's the original text. To a great extent, the history of our developing understanding of the Holocaust and the history of struggles over Holocaust memory is also a history of translation. Naomi Seidman's depiction, description of Holocaust memory as a translation project is absolutely right. This, I think, will be a good title for a utopian collaborative research project. And if anybody's interested in doing this with me, please let me know, because I'd love to do this. One could write the history of Holocaust memory in any country as a history of translation. The political visibility of victim groups often has to do with broad availability in translation, especially in English, allowing experiences of victims from particular backgrounds to be compared and understood as a common experience beyond national boundaries. So it's worth reflecting on what is excluded from an international historical and critical discourse in English, as well as what is included. Not only that, we could consider the extent to which the concerns and assumptions of English language discourse and publishing on the Holocaust have affected what is selected for translation, and therefore what is not selected, and how it's translated. To put it bluntly, Anglo-American English-speaking culture is a culture in which people think least about issues of translation, multilingualism, and linguistic difference. And it's the one where there are the biggest issues to deal with. A culture with its own colonial history of absorbing, marginalizing, or destroying minority languages and cultures would benefit from translational self-awareness. Here, I think we can learn a lot from scholars of colonialism and post-colonialism. It's one of the places where I think Holocaust studies and decolonial studies could really fruitfully engage with each other a lot more than we do already. Now, I could list dozens of open questions, each of which could form a project in its own right, but there were always new things one could do, especially in a field such as Holocaust studies, which is dynamic and very broad. My point here is a different one, though. It's about taking thinking about translation from the margins of what we do into the mainstream. But it's not simply a question for specialists, but it's something that we are aware of whenever we're working with testimonies or other kinds of evidence. There should be no thinking about the Holocaust that does not take into account issues of translation. It means learning to read with translation in mind. And I include times when we're reading or dealing with things that were translated from languages that we don't know or know only imperfectly. Given the multilingual nature of the Holocaust itself, this will be a lot of the time. We would need to know fluently about 30 different languages, at least, if we were really going to get to grips with Holocaust memories and testimonies in every single language of a victim. Everybody in this room um, will have done translation themselves in some way, will have read or used testimonies and other materials in translation, or will have a story about translation to tell. In fact, I think that translation and translation studies is always in some way about telling stories. How is this piece of spoken or written language transformed when it moves from one space to another? It's one of the basic structures of narrative. None of these stories are incidental or trivial, but the question is how to bring them together and understand them properly. And the work's just starting on this. Once we start listening to these stories, really hearing the voices of the translators behind or alongside the witnesses, then that helps us gain a critical self-awareness of how much we ignore translation and how much it has affected knowledge and ways of thinking about the Holocaust. Once one sees this and resolves to make translation visible, it very quickly becomes clear that the Holocaust is literally unthinkable without translation. Now, incidentally, just to finish, there's a fascinating set of records in the archive of the Frankfurt trial that I started this talk with, 
that documents how one of the interpreters campaigned for a pay rise, pointing out the skilled nature of her work and the physical and emotional strain that it put her through. After fighting her way through the bureaucracy and leaving a very long paper trail, she finally succeeded. If the West German court system in the 1960s can recognize the importance of translators for its work, then I think we can too. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was terrific. You've opened up so many questions there. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, plenty of questions coming through from our audience. Please do uh, put your questions into the, the Q&A and uh, we'll, we have time now to discuss them. Um, Peter, I wonder if I could uh, uh, kick off um, just by, in a way, following uh, following up one of the things you were talking about towards the end of your of your presentation, um, thinking about the the, the dominance of uh, Anglo American of English language um, discussion in Holocaust studies, I, I was wondering your you've been talking about um, the absolute centrality of translation. I was wondering how many languages are Holocaust testaments being, being translated into um, beyond English, German, French? Um, is it possible to have a, uh, well, presumably the, the Holocaust, the, the um, uh, discourses around the Holocaust are very different in, the, in different languages. And is it the case then that it, it's possible to have a meaningful discussion about the Holocaust in, in some languages which perhaps uh, lack um, many of the documents which have been translated into others? Hmm. This is it, a very important question. It's also a really complex one as well, um, because there are many, many different sort of linguistic and national contexts in which the Holocaust plays a defining role in people's memory and people's thinking about history and people's thinking about themselves. Um, so it'd be very hard to put a number on the number of languages that, that these testimonies have been uh, translated into. I think maybe we can think about it in terms of sort of linguistic spaces or, or in, in which the Holocaust is discussed. I mean, the point about English language discourse is very important, I think, because it's very authoritative and it's the international language. And of course, it uses words and terms in a particular way. And those terms have a history in English, particularly in sort of American uh, American Jewish discourses on, on the Holocaust, right, which have been very important for defining the way we think about it. Um, and those have an influence on how the Holocaust is talked about in other countries too. And they sometimes clash a little bit with sort of local traditions of remembrance and thinking as well. And these, these are contexts and controversies and discussions that, that we often don't have access to because they're all conducted in Polish or Russian or whatever it happens to be. But there's really interesting research being done, for example, on the translation culture within the Soviet Union and within the Soviet bloc um, during the Cold War, how testimonies were, were translated between the different languages of the, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, um, which didn't involve English at all and in, had no involvement of kind of English language discussion whatsoever. And those are affected by particular sort of Soviet style discourses of memory, um, which are very different from Western European discourses of memory. And we find after the end of the Cold War that those discourses of memory clash and confront the kind of Western discourses that, that we sort of take for granted. We can see it even now in, in sort of thing in the way Ukrainians have been talking about their experiences during the Russian invasion, where they like to compare it to fascism, they like to compare you know, the, the Russian invasion to the Nazi invasion. That feels very uncomfortable for in, in the German context, for example. Um, but that comes from a specific kind of linguistic and cultural context in which the Holocaust is talked about in a very different way. Um, so it is quite difficult to, to conceptualize because all these contexts are very dynamic and they change. And English language discourse has a, a huge effect on how the Holocaust is talked about. But in a sense, people take what they need. <laughs> they take the word Holocaust and translate it into their own language in particular ways. The word Holocaust appears in Russian at some point, you know, sort of in, in the last 20 years and is used in a specific way that is perhaps rather different from the way that we might 
want to use it. But I, I was going to ask about that, and, and presumably it makes a, a, a difference if you are thinking about the, the Shoah rather than the Holocaust. Yes. Or other... It does. I mean, there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of argument about this, and in some respects, one has to be very pragmatic about the terms that one uses. The Holocaust, one could question it. One could question the, the, the kind of root of the word to do with a burnt offering in Greek. You know, that seems rather contemptuous towards the victims and seems to give their, their deaths a sort of a, a meaning that they really don't have um, as a kind of a sacrifice, you know. Um, but at the same time, one has to be very pragmatic. It's a word that everybody knows. And the word choa was used in order to, to, to sort of bring, if you like, take back the Jewish specificity of the experience of the Holocaust. Um, but again, you know, I'm quite pragmatic about this stuff. And if people know the word Holocaust, they're not thinking about the Greek etymology of it, really, when they're using it. You know, they're, So I think one can be a little bit too sort of, if you like, pedantic in these, in these, these questions. Um, a question from uh, Silvina Katz, um, who asks, have there been recorded instances of testimonies given in different languages by the same survivor? And if so, were there any visible differences? Mm. Quite a lot, in fact, um, particularly survivors who moved from one context to another, the people who, who moved to Western Europe or the United States or to other parts of the world, they almost always give testimonies in different languages. Um, but people who give testimony in trials give testimonies in different languages. So I would say it's actually a very typical thing for, for a, a survivor to, to speak in different languages. Um, it's a very characteristic of the kind of the refugee experience, of course, is talking about your experience in a different language in a different context. Um, one of the most well-known ones, the most interesting ones from a kind of literary perspective is the testimony of Ruth Kluger, who many people will, will know. Um, she was an Austrian Jew, who survived Auschwitz and moved to the United States. Um, she has a, she writes her testimony in German and in English, and there's a very long history uh, behind this. And my colleague Andrea Hammer has, has written very interestingly about this. Um, the two texts are quite different because Ruth Kluger, as a very literate writer, um, knows that she's addressing different audiences with these texts. So her English testimony, although telling the same story, it tells it in quite a different way. It uses different kind of terms of reference um, and speaks to different kinds of historical experience. So her English testimony makes comparisons that her American readers may understand, whereas the German testimony doesn't do that because it wants it to be a specifically German read. OK, um, so there are the, you can read these texts together and they're fascinating as a, as a very deliberate change between an English and a German text. And I really do recommend that. Uh, the German, the, the English text is called Landscapes of Memory by Ruth Kluger. And if you read German, the German text is called Weiterleben. So uh, living on, continuing to live. So you can see the two different titles um, imply different things to do with this text. But I would say, yeah, in answer to your question, yeah, many, many, many people give different testimonies in different languages, yeah. Thank you. Um, an observation from Deborah Langton, I think it's more that than a question. Deborah says, a most insightful lecture, thank you so much. I think that the German Professional Association for Interpreters and Translators actually came into being as a direct result of the contribution made to post-war trials by those language professionals. Yes. Still, It's still the, the BDU of which I also happen to be a member. Right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's really very interesting. And actually, coincidentally, I've been looking at some archive work to do material to do with the, the Frankfurt trial where, and at the same time, the the the, the BDU is a sort of League of Translators and Interpreters, is it's really just being set up at this time. And it's it's thinking about codes of ethics, uh, codes of professional behavior for, for interpreters and translators and what kind of qualifications they should have. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, they, they, these trials are not just taking place in a sort of an airless room. They're really having significant effects on the professional standing of interpreters and translators and their pay and their working conditions um, and their training too. It's all up in the air in the 1960s a little bit because the people who are doing the work are often people who don't have very much training at the time, they, they may be refugees from Eastern Europe. So we get a lot of Polish and Romanian and Hungarian translators living in West Germany, who are simply because they're bilingual, are working for courts. And the, the Bund der Übersetzer is, is trying to professionalize this, you know, uh, because it's, it's clearly necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a really interesting observation. Um, 
A question from Beatriz de la Fuente. Hello, Beatriz. Beatriz was a, uh, a translator um, visiting us at BCLT mm. just a, a few years ago. Beatriz asks, thank you very much indeed for your lecture, Professor Davis. Some scholars consider it's unethical to translate works or documents by Goebbels or Hitler. Could you comment on that? I myself consider it important to know as much as possible about the Holocaust. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised. I don't, I, I don't know, do you, who, who considers this to be unethical? I mean, as a historian, surely you have to translate these things in order to talk to people who are not readers of German. Um, I think there are ethical issues connected with translating these things. And um, I'm trying, I believe Stefan Baumgarten has written very interestingly about the ethical issues connected with translating Mein Kampf you know, as the, the kind of the biggest example of this, this problem. Um, he's talked about various different English versions of Mein Kampf, some of which were translated by Nazi sympathizers, some of which were translated by convinced anti-Nazis. And the way that they responded to the material is, of course, very different. Um, so I guess in terms of an ethical approach, it depends what you're translating for, right? If you're translating for a historical historically interested readership, then I think what you really need to do is always contextualize the language, you know, with footnotes, you sort of distance the reader from it a little bit by, by using explanatory materials like this. And certainly the new German critical edition of Mein Kampf, which has been quite controversial and was published a couple of years ago, uses that kind of technique. It's full of footnotes and historical explanations. There's no way that you could read that text and get kind of carried away by it in any way. And I suspect the translation would have to do that too. You'd solve that ethical issue by showing your attitude towards the material when you're publishing it. Thanks, Peter. Um, a question from Claudia or perhaps Claudia uh, Strachan. Um, fascinating. Thank you very much. My question would be how best to transfer grammatical mistakes into the target language. I think she's thinking about your, your um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, your account of the, the different strategies that the, the Berlin and the, the Bergen Belt and um, transliterators were uh, adopting. Uh, Claudia says, I usually, I usually use footnotes or a general explanation regarding spelling mistakes and choice of vocab. Yeah, I think that's a very, it's a really difficult question, this. And I don't think there's one perfect answer to it. I suppose the answer is it depends what, what genre of text you're translating, right? Um, if you're translating a more kind of literary text or an autobiographical testimony where style is really important, um, you're not necessarily going to get grammatical errors in that, but you want to give an impression of what the, the author's doing. And if they're, trying, if they're writing something in a slightly awkward way, there may be a reason for that. You know? There may be another language underneath it somewhere that is affecting the way they, they write. You know, they may have, they maybe have several languages at their disposal. Um, and that's one of those languages affecting their, for example, their German may be affected by Yiddish. You know, that's that happens quite often. And so you can translate it in a way that shows that. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, as a translator, you're always concerned that somebody's going to read it and say this is a terrible translation because it reads really badly. But that's a conversation that you obviously have to have with your editor about that. Um, when you're tra translating things like these, these oral testimonies, it's a little bit more difficult, I think, um, because it's a real dilemma. You don't want your uh, your witness to look like an idiot. You know, you don't want to look like make them to look like a bad speaker, um, even though they might actually be that. But what you want is to do is is to gain the quality of their voice. You, know, you want to hear how they say things, how they choose to say things in a language that may not be their first language, and that is really vital. So I think footnotes and explanations are, the, are really the only way to do it. The problem with that is, of course, that editors and publishers don't always want this kind of stuff in a text. You know, they, 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 they're allergic to footnotes sometimes. So it, it's a really difficult dilemma and the translator often gets it in the neck here <laughs> and you end up having to make choices that you, <laughs> you probably wouldn't have made in an ideal situation. But it's really important and it, it's, it's really to do with the voice, because I think the voice of a, of a witness talking in a language that's not their native language is just as interesting and just as important in the choices that they make and the way they speak as anything they're saying in the language that they grew up in.
Perhaps um, following on from that, a um, question from Babette Lichtenstein, um, who says, firstly, thank you for your thought provoking lecture. Um, would you think of testimonies or memoirs in English by survivors whose original language was not English? Is that still a translation? <laughs> oh, yes, that's a very good question. Um, I, well, put it this way, it depends, doesn't it? I mean, it's um, if somebody's writing it as a memoir in the language of their adopted country, then clearly it is not a translation in itself, um, but it probably has translation in it somewhere. You know, within its structures, in its language, it will have translation. You know, the writer may sort of try to sweep it under the carpet a little bit, but they are certainly thinking about things that they experienced, where they were growing up, where they were going through the camp system or whatever their experiences happened, it happened to be, that happened in, in a different language or different set of languages. So that text will contain translation within it. Some writers make this explicit. I'm thinking of the one for writer Eva Hoffman, for example, um, in her works about coming from Poland to Canada. Um, she makes very explicit these linguistic issues that she had to deal with as she was going through this, this process. Um, but others don't, right? It depends what kind of writer they are, really. But I think as a reader, you can always find translation in there if you look. But I wouldn't necessarily call it a translation in that sense, because that seems to me a kind of a genre label that you want to put on something a bit more specific. I don't know whether that makes sort of makes sense to you, but thanks, Peter. Um, a, a comment from an anonymous attendee. Um, hmm. I think following on from uh, your uh, answer uh, to the, the previous question, um, who mentions uh, Hannah Arendt translating her own book on the Jerusalem trial of Eichmann. I think that was in relation yeah. to um, uh, testimonies in, in more than one language by the same witness, uh, raising the, the, the question of self-translation there. Yes, absolutely. Self-translation is, again, it's, it's very, very common. And someone like Hannah Arendt, she knows exactly who she needs to speak to with each text. Right. And she's clearly she wants to, you know, she's originally from from what I remember, she writes it originally in, in English for readers of a specific magazine in um, in the United States. But she wants to speak to her German audience, too. Um, I don't I haven't compared the translations to these texts, so I don't really know what it is she was trying to do. Um, but it's just very, very common uh, for people who have the resources and the time to do it. And of course, Hannah Arendt did have that. Now, I know that, that she was very critical of the German translations of interpreting at the Eichmann trial, right? She, she listened in to the English, French and German translations and was just completely furious with, with what happened with the German translation and didn't believe that it really gave a very good impression of what was going on. Um, but yeah, I think self-translation is, you know, there are people who've written about this in terms of Holocaust memory, and I think it's, it's extremely common. And I think it's not just common in the sense of translating a whole text, but also what you do within a text that you've written too. Um, I think of the, the, the Holocaust survivor, Philip Muller, who was a survivor of probably the worst experiences that a human being has ever had in the Sonderkommando, the Jewish Sonderkommando in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, sort of, um, working in the, in the gas chambers and the crematoria himself. And he wrote uh, testimonies, he gave testimony in Czech, he was, he was a, a Slovak, but he wrote in Czech. Um, that testimony has only just been recently published in Czech uh, for the first time a couple of years ago. Um, he moved to West Germany, he gave testimony at this trial I was talking about, and he moved to West Germany and wrote a text in German. But what you find in that text are extracts from his previous writings and speakings in Czech. So actually that text, although it's not a translation itself, contains translation within its structures. And that text, if you read it that way, tells us something about the history of the way he thought about language and his experiences. So I think if you read with translation in mind, you can find a lot more in these texts than is perhaps visible, um, you know, on first glance. A question from Zilin Bai. Um, thank you for your terrific talk. Um, to what extent do you think words or verbal accounts might mediate the power of the actual seeing, especially when we use the phrase the voice of the witness? When we talk about witness, we imply that there are eyes uh, that are seeing, there are scenes to be remembered. But the voice of the witness indicates that the visual scene has been transferred into a verbal form. Do you yes. think to come 
closer to the witness scene, the translator needs to re-represent the mental scene imprinted on the mind of the witness through words. That's, I, I don't know if you can, if you can uh, uh, take that one at this stage, Peter, but that's a really- <laughs> that's Such an interesting question, such an interesting question. Um, I think, yeah, it, I think when translating, you know, visualizing what's happening is a very important part of the process, right? But of course, so my initial reaction to you was yes, of course, right? Because as a translator, you you're trying to visualize what the what the writer has visualized and then has put into language. But actually, that's a kind of an impossible thing to do, isn't it? Because we we don't have these experiences to draw on ourselves, and actually, what I'm doing is I'm visualizing my feelings about the situation and I'm projecting my understanding of it onto this text if I'm not careful. And I'm using language you often find in translations that language is used that sort of seems to reflect the translator's feelings about what's what they're reading and what they're translating rather necessarily than what the original witness is giving us. Um, so I think one has to be a little bit careful. I think it's it's absolutely inevitable that if you're reading something that is a witness text, then the visual aspect of it is absolutely vital. You're absolutely right there. Um, and therefore we can't help when we're reading it, even without translating, we can't help creating these images in our, in our mind. But those images are to do with us as well and our feelings about the Holocaust and also to do with the kind of visual materials that we've gathered throughout our lives connected with the Holocaust. So if the, the witness is describing a gas chamber or the entrance to, to Birkenau with the famous ramp and the, and the railway line, what we're not doing is getting an image that is purely coming from that text. We're getting an image from all the images that we've seen and gathered throughout our lives too. So we're actually recreating it in a different way that has really not 100% to do with the text in front of us. So I think there are dangers involved there too. Um, but again inevitable but it's what bringing back to what francis jones said and i quoted him in the talk maximum awareness of ethical implications of what we're doing right if we spend a lot of time thinking about what we're doing and what it means and the ethical stance that we're taking up and if if you like sort of making that visible and making that explicit then we can do this I wonder if I could uh, just follow on from that with a, a question about the the ethical issues uh, involved in um, translating the Holocaust, because, of course, historically, there have been some really uh, central debates around the uniqueness of mm. the Holocaust. Mm. And uh, I'm wondering if there are um, if there are similar questions around the uniqueness, perhaps, of translating the Holocaust is, are the ethical issues that are raised and that you've been referring to, are they unique? I, I think at one point you did uh, uh, suggest that they were, that they, they would be unique to the process of translating the Holocaust. I'm just wondering whether, on the other hand, one might see translating the Holocaust as a uh, as a an example of a kind of ethical uh, challenge which translators might meet with in other contexts as well, in in other conflict situations, for example. I think, um, yeah, the uniqueness debate is a very significant one. Um, and it's still going on in particular contexts as well, particularly in Germany, I would say. Um, I, I haven't come across um, any writing or scholarship that suggests that translating a Holocaust testimony is a unique thing, right? Because um, I, I, it, it just isn't, right? It just obviously isn't. I think if one's translating a text by a survivor of another genocide, then the issues are likely to be the same or similar. You will have different linguistic histories to draw on. You will have different traditions of representation to draw on, which will all present their own advantages and disadvantages from things about, you know, sort of genocide in former Yugoslavia or Rwanda, the, the, the traditions of thinking about this stuff and and projecting it and writing about it and representing it and therefore translating it are very different. And the, the status of the different languages that are involved here are also very different, I would say. But at the same time, they're comparable. Okay, so the whole, the whole thing about this translating a Holocaust text is comparable to translating texts arising from other genocides, even if it's not exactly the same. So 
it's unique in that sense because it's not the same but it doesn't have this kind of ideological feeling of uniqueness you know being like nothing else and i think the whole point about translation really is that it's a form of comparison too right i mean it's uh, if you if you translation is a kind of an optimistic process you're saying i can say this in a different language right you have to be an optimist to translate if you thought that it was impossible, you wouldn't do it. Or you produce a text that is all about the impossibility of translation, which I guess could be done. Um, but um, there are some people who said, well, I don't think it's possible to translate these texts adequately. Maybe that's true, but it depends what you mean by adequate, right? Uh, it depends. You can't translate the qualities of a Yiddish survivor testimony into a non-Jewish majority language. It, it doesn't, doesn't quite work, right? It's gonna be different. Um, it's gonna have a different feeling to it. It's gonna have a different history behind it, a different set of traditions, um, different music to it, a different set of echoes to it, right? So in that sense, but even then I wouldn't use the word unique. I would say that is a translation problem that you have to deal with and you have to be sensitive to. Um, so I, I don't find the uniqueness debate actually particularly relevant to, to this question, to be honest, but it's it's one that's always echoing down the discussion about the Holocaust, but it does, hasn't really affected translation in the same way, I don't think. Thank you. Um, yes, thinking of uh, uh, comparisons then, perhaps just a, a, a final uh, observation or question from Cyrus, um, who asks, um, do you think that the topic of looking into how things are being translated is something that could come into prominence in light of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, I've heard but couldn't confirm that the UK has a lack of Russian-speaking journalists. <laughs> I'm sure that's true, yes. I mean there are of course plenty, you know, but there are people that are Russian speakers. Um, I suspect it's more a problem of having people who aren't Ukrainian speakers. I think that's that's probably been the problem in the kind of post-Soviet sphere. I mean, the thing is, I learned Russian at university and there was no possibility to learn Ukraine. Right? It just wasn't an issue because you assume that what you're dealing with is essentially Russian. Okay. And those great Ukrainian writers like Nikolai Gogol or, or Hohol, as he is in Ukrainian originally, um, were considered to be Russian writers. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably absolutely true. There aren't enough people that speak these languages, but but certainly what we now understand is the specificity of a particular language. So what it means to be writing in Ukrainian rather than Russian, what it means to be writing in Yiddish rather than a, a non-Jewish language, just to go back to the Holocaust examples. Um, it means something different to write in a different language. So it doesn't mean it's impossible to translate, but it means you are sensitive to what languages mean you know, and not just what words in languages mean, but what the language itself actually means, what, what its significance is for the people who speak it. Thank you. I'm aware we're, we're running out of time and a little flurry of questions has just come <laughs> through, but we could perhaps take uh, take one last yeah. question uh, from uh, my colleague Marianne Arribas Tome, who mm -hmm. says, uh, fascinating to learn about your work, many thanks. Linked to this idea of translating images or visual material, are there any intersemiotic translations that you are aware of involving images or photos of the Holocaust being put into words? Uh, hmm. I'm not a specialist on this area, to be honest, so but I'm sure there are. Um, I have to think a little bit about this one. Yeah, I mean, I think the example that occurs to me, um, I'm sure there are plenty of better examples than this, is there are famous um, photographs that were taken by inmates in Birkenau secretly. Um, most of the photographic evidence we have from concentration camps is taken by perpetrators, right? taken by the SS um, for documentation purposes and all sorts of other reasons. So they are perpetrator angles on the witnesses. They're very important, but they are still taken by perpetrators. These four photographs were taken by um, victims on a smuggled camera. Right? And they're very vague and indistinct, but you can see certain things. They're very famous pictures. Um, which have been talked about an awful lot in different kinds of contexts. One sees a landscape with some trees and one sees some people some, some people waiting um, to be killed and then one sees their bodies and people walking across them um, 
sort of stepping carefully over these bodies. Then there's a couple of ones where they've just got an angle of, of a couple of trees where they haven't been able to take it properly because they've been hiding. Um, and these are amazing photographs and they've been written about an awful lot. Um, and I suspect you would find uh, writing, um, Georges Didier Hubermont, for example, has written about this um, quite a lot about how to write about these um, photographs. Um, the painter Gerhard Richter, if you want to take a non-written approach to it, has produced a set of paintings based on them, for example. So it's another form of intersemiotic translation. They're taking them from a photographic evidence to a painted sort of palimpsest um, drawing on that. So there's there's quite a lot of this kind of stuff, I would say. But again, I'm not a specialist on this kind of visual intersemiotic study. So, but that's that's what occurs to me. Georges Didier Hubermont is is a very interesting critic writing about these things. Well, thank you everybody for your uh, for your questions. Thank you, uh, Peter, for taking so many questions, and uh, thank you again for a really fascinating presentation that's uh, opened up so many issues for us. Um, I think we we need to uh, leave it there. So uh, thank you all once again, and uh, Peter in particular. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all your questions. This has been fantastic. Thank you. And please do, if, if you have any questions, please do contact me and my University of Edinburgh address. I'm quite happy to continue this conversation with, with anybody who's interested.